Welcome to today's program, and thank you for joining us. I'm C. Virginia Fields, former Manhattan Borough President and the current President of the National Black Leadership Commission on Health, formerly known as the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS. But even under this new name, we are furthering its mission of advocacy and empowerment to include expanded areas of disparities in Black health. That includes HIV AIDS, hepatitis C, cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, prostate cancer, sickle cell, diabetes, and mental health. And today, our show will discuss mental health. During these challenging times of the COVID-19 pandemic, not only are we seeing more people struggling and trying to deal with mental health, just as we are all dealing with emotional, financial, physical, spiritual, and other things that have upended things that we do. So today to discuss this, I'm very pleased to have Patrice N. Douglas. Patrice is a licensed therapist, certified anger management specialist, and certified parent-child interaction therapist. She's located, a company is located in California and Texas. She is currently a doctoral student, candidate rather, at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology in Los Angeles. She's also an entrepreneur as the owner of Improv Counseling and Consultation located again in California, Texas, and here in New York, where she specializes in anger management, men's issues, minority mental health, as well as parenting. Let me say, Welcome, Patrice, to our show today. And again, given uh, the unprecedented situation we are facing globally with respect to COVID-19, I'm certain that uh, your work has been increased um, over and over again beyond perhaps what you were doing. So we're so glad that you're here. Let me just make a few comments about mental health because actually May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And therefore, we wanted to focus on that as well as, as I said, related to what we're now experiencing in these challenging times. The Black community is 20% more likely to experience serious mental health problems than the general population. Common mental health disorders among the Black community includes depression, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, suicide, especially among young Black men, and post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, as we mostly refer to that. However, only about one in three Blacks who need mental health care will get it. This is because of insurance barriers, stigma, lack of awareness, education, and distrust of the medical community. But now more than ever, we need to put significant resources to help us address issues of mental health. So, Patrice, to get us started, why don't you just take a few minutes to tell us a little about how you got started in this work in the first place? Uh, well, from a young child, I always knew that I wanted to 
be a therapist or be um, in some type of profession that was helping people. I always thought that I was going to be um, an FBI um, criminal profiler. Um, I definitely believe that those that are incarcerated, a lot of people um, throw away their chances on them. And so I always felt like if they're going to come back into society, they deserve a fair chance and having somebody understand them and help them. Um, so from a young child, I knew that I was going to be in psychology. So I just, you know, went through school and did everything that I needed to do. And I'm finally a licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, I'll be done with my doctoral program in June of this year. And mental health is something that is very important to me, um, especially being an African-American woman, seeing the things that we go through that we normalize when it's really, you know, killing us softly inside. And so my mission is always to not only help the world, but also take care of my community. Wonderful, wonderful. So can you just speak a little about what you are experiencing, especially as it relates to these times we're in right now? Here in New York City, we have on, a, I think it's about our 48th day of uh, sheltering in place. And now there are discussions about opening up and we can talk a little about that, the impact that that clearly is having mentally, emotionally, and otherwise, aside from the fact that certain people feel that they need the financial resources. So can you just talk a little about what you are going through or what you're experiencing with related to your work during these challenging times? Well, definitely the work has increased. Um, like you mentioned, I do have my own practice, Empire Counseling and Consultation. I'm also a program director of an outpatient substance abuse agency. And so I've seen an increase in individuals not only needing help for their addiction, but also their mental health issues and relationships. I mean, if you're sitting at home because you're quarantined and you really don't have anything pressing to do other than maybe some telework or if you're not working, all you can do is be in your thoughts all day. And so a lot of people are struggling with feeling caged in. Um, a lot of people are um, dealing with uh, feeling sadness, like they don't know when the pandemic is going to end or where their life will begin after the pandemic. And outside of that, if you have kids and husbands and partners at home, everybody's lumped under one roof together for 24 hours a day. There's a lot of conflict and turmoil and no escape. And so we have seen uh, an increase in anxiety in individuals, an increase in depression, um, especially when they're watching the news. We forget that every time we watch the news, it can create a form of PTSD because it is trauma. And so if that's all we're fixated on at all day to determine how, you know, the, the country is going to open back up to how many more cases do we have of people dying, it does put you in a depression state. And a lot of people don't know how to get out of that. Now, when the pandemic first started, I know that New York was a little bit more um, ahead of the game than California, but California was very aggressive in doing the shelter in place. So the first few weeks of um, the increase in therapy clients that I received, a lot of it was dealing with what's going to happen to us. We're at home. Now it's kind of shifted to where more people are more concerned about their relationships or anxiety outside of COVID-19, that it seems like the topic at hand is not COVID-19 necessarily, but what COVID-19 has done to them personally, that it's made them less sociable, uh, wanting to talk to people, urging to talk to people, urging to break, you know, shelter in place rules. So that's more about what most people are talking about in therapy, not necessarily that we're going into the pandemic. It's like how the pandemic changed them and they don't know who they are anymore. And how do we make adjustments in terms of our personal, professional, family, community, and other uh, areas of our life? Because everything is basically been upended. You mentioned about watching TV and, uh, and how that can create stress. I'm definitely on a uh, program where I buy, I probably maybe tune in twice a day. I like to hear my governor, Governor Cuomo, give his live uh, report. Sometimes I may hear the mayor, but mostly I'm definitely on the governor's report because it's more expansive. And in the evening for the evening news. After that, whatever I, you know, hear in passing or see flash, if it's something I want to read, but nine times out of ten, it's not. So I definitely have trained myself 
and not to be on that TV watching that for these many hours because it can really stress you out. Just yesterday, when our governor had part of his report, he talked about the fact that, I don't know if he said the majority or but certainly a significant number of people who have come, you know, um, have the disease are at home. They're not traveling to work. They're not riding the subways. They're not using public transportation. So with all of us who have been sheltering in place now for over 40 days, that really raised an eyebrow. So that could produce stress. So I had to go to what I have to do, bring it down, go to my space, meditate, pray, my faith, knowing God's got it no matter what I hear. But I can understand how uh, that becomes so stressful in so many ways. So can you de uh, define for us the difference uh, between anxiety and depression? And how do people know when they need therapy? So my rule of thumb for needing therapy is that everybody can benefit from therapy. I don't care if you're a therapist yourself, psychologist, medical professional, pastor, whoever. There's nothing wrong with having a conversation with someone that is not in your immediate circle. A lot of times we like to use our friends and family as therapists, but we have to forget that they have a personal stake in our lives. And even though they may give solid, solid advice, they have a bias. They want to see us do well. They want us to maybe see us do what they want us to do. So I always say, if you feel like life is overwhelming to the point where you're not able to function as far as you're not sleeping well, you're not eating well, um, your thoughts are all over the place, um, you don't feel happy, it's time to start talking to someone about getting coping skills. Now, when it comes to anxiety and depression, they definitely can go hand in hand. Um, depression can lead um, somebody having anxiety and anxiety can lead to somebody having depression. When we talk about the two, anxiety is more about the fear of unknown. So you don't really know what's going on or you're, um, you're fearful about something, therefore your heart may start racing. You may have racing thoughts. Um, your heart rate may go up. You may can't sleep at night because all you're doing is worrying about something that you may not have control over it. And um, I always tell everyone that even though generalized anxiety disorder or social anxiety or agoraphobia, um, you know, is a, is a condition all of us have experienced some type of anxiety, whether it's our first speaking presentation or um, having to go to a new job for the first day. We all know what anxiety feels like. Um, and some people do need medications to calm those, those chemical imbalances down when they're feeling very overwhelmed. Then we have depression where it seems like there's a sense of hopelessness. You're feeling very down. You have lack of motivation to do anything. You find yourself sleeping more often or you may not be sleeping at all. Um, it's pretty much taking the joys out of the simple things that you would like to do in life and you don't see yourself getting out of that dark cloud. And so because they're, they're both so heavy, they can actually come together and you can have a diagnosis that has both anxiety and depression. But the great news about it is, is that it's manageable. Um, it can be um, treated very well and it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be on medications, but that is an option. But there are many of us that are walking around with anxiety and depression and living our best lives. Well, how do we dispel the myth, especially among communities of color, about uh, being, you know, the stigma that we often hear about, and I'm sure you see, associated with uh, getting therapy or feeling like, uh, well, if anybody knows I have a therapist, they may think that I'm mentally sick or stigmatize people. How do we dispel that myth, especially based on your description of uh, the difference between anxiety, depression, and some of the signs just based on how we feel every day? I think that it's overcoming that there's an issue in the room. I think, um, especially in the Black community, we've been conditioned um, to just take life on as we can and to suck it up, be strong and just get through it because nobody cares about the sorrow and the sad stories. But in reality is, is a lot of the things that we do to thrive in this world and become strong is eating away at our mental health. And so I think if we take the, the, 
the stigma out of that the only way that you could talk to a therapist is if you have a mental disorder or you're crazy that's completely wrong i mean therapists can do a scope of things we could talk about life transitions from you maybe going from one job to a next maybe you're having a career dilemma you don't even know where you want to go there's therapists that can help with that you're having problems with communication with your friends or your loved ones we work on communication it's not always tackling psychotic issues it's tackling the things in life that make you uneasy and so i think if if the black community understood about the range of things that they can get in a therapy session just someone to talk to then i think they would be more comfortable with that because if we look at the black community when it comes to life coaches versus therapists they're more inclined to go to a life coach because it sounds like you're doing personal development but when you go to a therapist it sounds like something's wrong with you you can go to therapy and get personal development as well so i think it's changing the narrative on what therapy really can look like also too um i don't believe that we know what trauma is so if we we're going through life we see it on tv you know there's a lot of things going on in the news right now especially when it pertains to black men when we look at those things those are very devastating but we're not realizing that putting ourselves through the same trauma over and over the things that we we dealt with growing up the things that our parents saw the things that we saw that our parents saw they don't see that as trauma they don't see that as something that they need to heal from so i think it's just more awareness and conversation about what trauma is, what um, what things that we can work on within ourselves that we may can't get by ourselves or with family members. And so how does one go about uh, finding a therapist? And this is particularly of interest now, given again what we're going through. When we look at um, health disparities that disproportionately impact uh, communities of color, and for those of us who know this, it is no surprise that this, these are the populations that are most vulnerable. If anyone to say that they are so surprised, I kind of look askew at them because again, these disproportion, this, disproportionate uh, impact has been for far too long. So given the fact that a lot of that is related to lack of access to medical care as far and also probably uh, therapists. How does one go about finding a therapist? And what makes that person be able to start feeling comfortable talking with that person? Definitely, there are way more resources out there for um, finding therapists. Um, there are a few websites that you can go to. You can always check out Psychology Today. That's the biggest search engine for therapists. Um, if you're looking for a therapist of color, you have Therapy for Black Girls. You have Melanin and Mental Health therapy for black men. And so you can go to these sites and actually pick and choose your therapist based off of how you how you feel about them by reading their bio. Um, another way is if you have insurance and your insurance it covers behavioral health, they do have their own um, network directory of people that specifically um, take that insurance. Um, there are other platforms like Talkspace, BetterHelp, um, open path where you can get a sliding scale and what we say by sliding scale reduce rate in therapy sessions if you can't afford based off if you don't have insurance or you can't pay full fees but i will say that the black community as far as the behavioral professionals we have st we have stood up and we have provided pro bono a uh, free um therapy sessions to not only the frontline workers but also to our community because we know that times are hard but I will say, if you do have insurance, this may be the time to get into therapy because a lot of them are waiving co-pays. So you may not have to come out of pocket for your, your sessions. They're covering that for you. So if you are interested in getting to therapy, of course, your first, your first go-to can always be the internet, but also check your insurance providers if you do have insurance. But again, that's one of the things that I continue to see that's missing, whether it's related to resources around finding a therapist or just access to other um, needs that people are experiencing during this time. Everybody says, go to the internet, go to the website. But we know we're dealing a lot in our communities where these resources are just simply not available. People do not have access, and that has been highlighted during this 
uh, pandemic. So what other ways can we possibly reach our communities when everybody is still sheltering in place and we don't see the outreach in the streets as we normally would see? Yes, you bring up a very valid point. And I think that's where the struggle is right now because we can't really be on foot. Um, so we're, we're relying a lot on technology right now. So whether it's the internet and social media, that's how we're getting the word around. But in all honesty, a lot of times we can ask in our own in our own circles. I know that we don't want anybody to know that we're going to therapy, but you'd be surprised how many people in your actual circle that know of a therapist or can recommend a therapist. And so we do have to kind of band together and kind of spread the news about different resources because we are very limited. Um, unfortunately, a lot of individuals may not feel comfortable looking for a therapist online, um, but a lot of them have found therapists through Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, commercials on TV. I think that's also very key because a lot of people are watching more TV now. Uh, where they are able to get those resources, but you're absolutely right. The ways that we were able to reach people before is lacking. And we're trying to figure out plan B's on how to, you know, reach the masses in that way, but it is, it has been a struggle. Okay, in the last few minutes, a few minutes that we have, and this is a conversation that I know could have gone longer than the allocated time, but I'd like you to touch up on two other areas. And one is any recommendations for parents with children and teenagers who won't have summer activities? And what are some of the things people uh, can do during this time to take care of their mental health while sheltering in? So for the kids and the teens, I think it's very important to still keep them on a schedule. Even if they don't have summer activities where they're going to swimming or camp, there are a lot of life skills that they can learn at this time that'll prepare them to be you know, better adults in the future. So whether it's learning how to cook, learning how to do different household things, um, there is a lot of things that they can do at home that's outside of being on a computer to learn you know, educational things or being outside the house. These are moments where we can spend more time with each other adapting and learning different things that we don't learn in school but the key is to always keep your children on a routine so if they need to go to bed at a certain time keep that during the summer wake them up at a certain time so that they can have the full day to get things done um and what was the other question you had the other question we had to do with what are some things that people can do during this time to take care of their mental health uh, while sheltered in so if you are on social media, um, it, there's a lot of virtual support groups that are happening that are low cost or free. And so those are critical moments to jump in and get that support that you need. Meditation, there's a lot of free meditations app, apps on um, a lot of the different Android and Apple store um, where you can download free meditation and learn how to calm your body. Um, another great tool is journaling. A lot of times we don't know really how to talk to people or what to say, but writing it out stops the racing thoughts and it kind of calms us down. So journaling, meditation, making sure that you're eating the best that you can, stay away from takeout as much and please get sleep. And I know some of you guys are saying I'm getting way too much sleep. Then let's put you back on a schedule where you're only getting seven to eight hours. But I will say for the black community, it's okay if you don't have any energy to be creative. A lot of us feel like we have to stay busy, make you know these hustles, be an entrepreneur, don't be lazy, but we're never gonna get a time again in life where we're encouraged to do self-care and to take a break. And so please be kind to yourself and take that break. If you're not functioning for the day because you don't feel like it, watch Netflix all day. If you wanna work on something for a little bit and take a break, do so. But we need to be more kinder on ourselves that this is our time for us to rejuvenate ourselves so that whatever happens in the next six months, we're ready to tackle it. Now, one thing you mentioned when you were talking about parents and children, you said uh, follow the same schedule and activities pretty much as you have, but typically in the summer, that's the time when you don't have to get up at the same time. You don't have to do the homework. So why is it important to follow that routine during the summer months when activities like swimming and all of that is no longer in place? Can't the kids um, rest a little longer or stay up a little later and change the routine? <laughs> 
I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying they have to get up like at 6 a.m. Monday through Friday or nothing like that. Like, I wouldn't do that. Um, but what I'm saying is that since there's not any planned activities, what we don't want to do is become couch potatoes in a sense. So right. if, you have, if you have a schedule where you're waking up at a certain time, you're able to thrive and accomplish something between those hours that you're awake and the time that you calm it down. Um, and the only reason why I say that, too, is because this may be our new normal. I mean, majority of the states, the schools are shut down for the rest of the school year, which I know is only a few weeks. But we don't know what September or August is going to look like. This may It may look like summer 3.0 at this point. And so even though we are in a situation where school and activities are not happening, that doesn't mean that we still shouldn't have a routine of when we wake up, when we do things, when we take breaks, and when we go to sleep. These are basic needs that we need as adults, is that routine. Everybody needs a routine. The more we get off a routine, the harder it is to get back on that routine. So instead of them waking up at six, maybe they need to wake up at eight so that they can get the crusties out of their eyes and get up at nine. But there still should be a set time that they need to be up and functioning at a certain time. And I think that's so important because it's been emphasized uh, more and more that people should get up and get dressed. Do not yes. sit around in your night clothes, your pajamas and your robe all day. It could be very comforting, but that does not uh, help you in terms of your thought process, your mental state, emotionally, nor spiritually. So I thank you so much for that. And our closing member, just share with everyone how they can contact you and any last comments that you might want to make about what some things we might not have covered. Yes. Yeah, so before I close out, I do want to acknowledge you're right. You should get dressed, take a shower. If anything, wash your face. That always makes you feel better and rejuvenated and brush your teeth. Um, I think that's very imperative, too, um, especially wearing the mask. We need we need to just make sure we're taking care of our face. I don't know if women or men have been experiencing more breakouts with wearing masks and things like that. But keeping our faces are clean is very priority. Um, if you want to reach out to me, um, I do have a couple of websites. If you want to check out my personal website, you can uh, find me at patricendouglas.com. If you want to check out my, my therapy practice, which has now been expanded to Florida. And uh, due to the pandemic, I am able to take um, virtual um, clients in New Jersey. You can find me at empirecounseling.net. I am on all social media platforms. My two favorites are Instagram and Twitter. So you can find me on Instagram at the Patrice Nicole and on Twitter, Patrice N. Douglas. Well, thank you so much, Patrice. This has been very, very helpful. And I would love to have been able to delve into some of the issues a little bit more. This new way of virtual uh, communicating is something that we're all trying to get used to. But thank you so much and uh, for joining us today for this exciting discussion, especially during the month of mental health, May being the mental health month. So for more information about uh, the work that we do and to remind everyone about the census, we ask you to visit nyc.gov forward slash census. And for more information about our organization, the National Black Leadership Commission on Health, please visit our website at nblch.org. Also look for us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. The Manhattan Neighborhood Network brings these programs to you to better inform you, the public, about the important topics that impact your health and well-being. Please let your family, friends, and neighbors know about this program. And again, I am C. Virginia Fields, and I thank you for joining us and hope you'll tune in next time for Health Action TV here on Manhattan Neighborhood Network, and that you will remain safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you.